I see you've demoted Mr. Beer, Mr. Blake. <laughs> very good. Only Off you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Before the break, we were looking at the 31st of October 2013 board meeting. Uh, I'm now going to turn to the November board meeting, and that can be found at poll 00021520. <coughs> Thank you. These are the minutes, and we can see there that you are not in attendance on that day and have provided... Uh, your apologies. Uh, again, is that because the work at the new department was um, very busy on that particular occasion? Yes, it's the same issue um, that was in those few weeks, yeah. And on this occasion, if we scroll down, we can see there is a significant update on Horizon. The board has noted the progress on Project Sparrow, the discussion of the working group, uh, if we go over the page, uh, we see there at C, past prosecutions being discussed, at D, future prosecutions being discussed. There's a request for a note from the general counsel uh, explaining who was named in past prosecutions and the liability for the business. If we go over to page three, please, towards the bottom of page three, we can see there at G, the board noted the update on risk management and the actions being taken as set out in that paper. And I'd just like to take you to the paper. It's at poll 3027483. It's a paper prepared by Chris Ojard. If we have a look at 2.2, allegations relating to the integrity of the horizon system there is a risk that the allegations relating to the integrity of the horizon system if not contained could raise wider questions over the robustness of our core systems and our ability to operate damaging amongst other matters current partnerships new areas of expansion and public and government confidence um, this meeting would you accept was it was an important board meeting in the context of horizon issues I think all the boards, as I've said, after July were important on this issue because each one took an update. Um, yeah. And here we have the risk management update referring there to potential issues to do with government confidence arising from Horizon. Um, wasn't that an important moment to have the government representative on the board present at the board meeting? I'm not sure the paper and the moment, if you see what I mean, are the key thing. The, the, the bigger point you're making is that I wasn't present at that board, which, as I've described, was because of my other role. I would have read the papers. I would have been doing the follow-up around the edges, including with the shareholder team. Um, it's not totally clear to me whether that point on government confidence is actually about the revenue lines from government or more widely, but absolutely. I mean, this issue was extremely significant. We'd put in train all of these actions. It was high now on the post office's risk register, so. If yeah, we turn back to the minutes themselves, it's poll 3021520. I mean, there was discussion at this meeting. This was the meeting where past prosecutions were discussed, future prosecutions were discussed. Well, the, the Audit and Risk Committee um, had taken a discussion on the future prosecutions paper and hadn't reached a decision and then decided to come back in February, as we then see, including with a discussion at the full board. But yes, I mean, a whole series of important issues were being discussed at this and the other board meetings. And at this time, you also weren't sitting on the Audit and Risk Committee anymore. I was not. Um, why not put in place an immediate replacement at this stage? Well, when you're appointed to a board, there's a whole series of things happen, um, and in order to be replaced, the shareholder team needed to find a replacement. The post office would have to accept that replacement, and the steps would have to be taken. So I think I was flagging at this stage, as I already said, to Mark Russell, who is my line manager and the director general um, and responsible for the shareholder executive 
that I had these concerns. I don't think it would have been very easy just to sub in a person who wasn't a board member as a sort of observer, if that's what you mean. Um, but I did feel, and that's why I took the steps to uh, step down from this board, because I felt whoever did it <coughs> needed to be there. And as you know, and as I've said in my statement, I was very clear to my successor, which in the end ended up being Richard Callard, that he needed, in my view, to be on both the Sparrow subcommittee, which was the place where these issues were being principally addressed, and on the Audit and Risk Committee. Looking back at those two meetings that we've just been looking at, do you think there were missed opportunities there? Where um, I've, I've set out in my statement a series of reflections and missed opportunities. I didn't particularly think these, this meeting and the one before fell into that, but it's, it's obviously hard to say when I wasn't at the meeting. Moving on to discussions regarding the post office's prosecution role, um, you were party to some of those discussions in February 2014. By that stage, had matters moved on in your other role? Was it less work uh, taking place on the £50? Uh, it was completed. It, it had been implemented and the customers who were getting that discount had got it. So yes, it was a, a short, intense period that just happened to coincide with this November board meeting. Thank you. If that could come down, please. And by February 2014, there are, seem to be three options on the table. Um, options A, B, and C. Option A being preservation of the status quo. Option B being focusing more on egregious conduct. Uh, and option C being ceasing all prosecution conduct. And I'm going to turn to a few documents where those options are discussed, uh, where you have contributed. Could we please start at poll 00167751? And it's page 4, 7th of February 2014. Thank you. If we turn to page four, we can see there is a email chain. Um, can you assist us? This is referring to an audit and risk committee teleconference on the 11th of February. You're copied into, or you're a recipient of that email. Um, can you assist us with why that would have been sent to you at that time? So my understanding is that in November 2013, the Audit and Risk Committee had taken a paper on future prosecutions, which at the time had options A to D. They asked for more information, and therefore it was coming back to the following Audit and Risk Committee, which was in February 2014. Although I wasn't on the Audit and Risk Committee, I think the decision had been taken at the previous Audit and Risk Committee that the full board should at least be able to provide their input on the options set out in the paper, but the actual decision was going to be taken by the Audit and Risk Committee. So my understanding of this Friday, uh, the 7th of February 2014 email is that is that Audit and Risk Committee paper being sent to us. Thank you. And at this period, if your diary had fewer commitments, was that an opportunity where you could have rejoined the Audit and Risk Committee? When I took the decision at the beginning of uh, March 2013 about the following year and which committees to sit on, I felt that was for the year. It was quite difficult, I think, to chop and change in terms of committee membership. And at this point, there was still not a government representative on the Audit and Risk Committee. No, nothing, nothing had changed in the sense that from uh, April 2013 until April 2014, there wasn't a government representative. At April 2014, when, in the end, Richard Callard took over from me, he was on the Audit and Risk Committee. Thank you. If we scroll up, please, to page three... Um, we see there Alice Perkins has contributed her view that option C has been dismissed too summarily. And she says, I do, of course, understand that we couldn't just throw our cases at the CPS and walk away at a moment's notice. 
and I appreciate that we might find the CPS route less satisfactory in cases where we were convinced we should be prosecuting, <coughs> but if it is the case that the banks and other financial institutions are content to live with this, why are we different? Could I please turn to UKGI 3043711. We then have Paula Venels' contribu contribution to this discussion. Uh, and she says, I thought it would be worth sharing my thoughts uh, on why we're different. In my mind, it relates to the operational nature of the post office rather than product or services uh, where there is more commonality. Uh, the difference, and perhaps not immediately obvious to our leading council, is scale. Uh, none of the businesses Brian Altman compared us to has a network the size of ours. Um, if we scroll down, she says we're more complex and operate without the ability to monitor our agents easily. Uh, this is an important area for the business, uh, and so I am particularly grateful to our non-executive directors for your attention. Uh, we will do what we can to facilitate a good debate. At that point in time, can you recall what the different positions were uh, amongst the board? You mean at 22.57 on Sunday, uh, the Sunday night? I exactly. Well, th that weekend, over the course of that weekend. Um, well, I think it's, as just shown, the paper had come round. Alice had set out her position. Paula has just disclosed. There was actually a chain, I think, where... Um, everybody was replying, um, and I replied on the Monday morning just after 7 a.m. And we have your reply at poll 00138141, the bottom of the first page. And you say, thanks for copying me on these papers. And given I'm not on the Audit and Risk Committee, I'm just passing my thoughts for information. Uh, but my read of the paper was similar to Alice's. It doesn't seem we had sufficient reasons to discard option C, and I think it would be interesting to explore further. It seems hard to imagine in 2014 the post office is so different from our organisations to necessitate this approach. As an aside, I also find the statistics for the post office surprising, and I can't help wondering if any other organisation, to the extent we could get comparable data, would have anything like this level of situations that need investigating. Either way, I would have thought any next steps must be accompanied by more focus on training and better support, uh, but sure, that's ongoing anyway. Can you assist us with why you took the view you did as opposed to the view that Paula Venels has expressed in that previous email? I mean, I think the what I wrote here speaks for itself. I hadn't been in the November 2013 ARC discussion nor would I therefore have seen the ARC paper, which came in November 2013. So notwithstanding the trail in on this issue, this was the first time that I'd seen it. And I think I would have had in my mind all of the things that we had set in train as actions and the papers we'd read from July, the 12th paper onwards the year before. And I felt instinctively uncomfortable with prosecutions and I didn't think the data was there in the paper to back it up. Had you discussed it with Shex at all? I don't remember having discussed this ARC paper, bearing in mind we got it a few days before at the time of my reply. This would be the sort of thing I was doing as a board member with my board hat on, so I wouldn't routinely check with them before. Um, I certainly would have been discussing it with them, though, because Richard Callard obviously was getting up to speed. He was the new Will Gibson in my mind, um, and I certainly would have told him what I thought about this. And as you know, he came also to the February and to the March board. Absolutely. And let's have a look at those board minutes, please. Can we please turn to poll 00021522? This is the 26th of February board meeting. It lists you as being present and Mr. Callard as being in attendance. If we scroll down, we can see the chairman opened the meeting and welcomed Richard Callard, non-executive director, designate shareholder executive, who would be attending this and the March board before taking over from Susanna Storey. 
Could we scroll down, please, over the page to the bottom of page two? Review of current prosecution policy, and then over the page, we see that the board approved the implementation of option B as a new prosecution's policy. Do you recall speaking up in favor of your preferred option, option C? I'd already expressed my views in the email chain, and then um, this was being considered by the ARC. I can't remember if in the room those of us who had a different view expressed it again. But when you don't chair a subcommittee, no one board member has a veto. Uh, it's, I'm not sure at this point I would have changed it, but I can't remember if I said anything in particular. Could we please turn to poll 3021523? This is the March meeting. This was your final board meeting, was it? It was. Yes. And we have you down for items 1431 to 1438. Uh, Richard Callard present. Was there a particular reason why you were only present for part of that meeting? I can't recall now. Um why that was. If we scroll down, we can see Project Sparrow is addressed. The CEO reminded the board of the background to Sparrow and the initial complaint review and mediation scheme and introduced the work which Linklaters had been asked to undertake to clarify the company's legal position. So you were present for the discussion regarding Project Sparrow and Linklaters. If we scroll down, down to page eight, please. At 14.43, we have the Project Sparrow insurance issue being raised. So that is a moment at which you're not present at this particular board. And it says, the board discussed the professional indemnity insurance and the Sparrow compensation risks. The CFO explained that professional indemnity insurance could only cover incidents for which the business was legally responsible. Therefore, any compensation paid outside that legal requirement could not be covered by uh, professional indemnity insurance. The board asked uh, the business to consider enhancing its insurance expertise and to reconsider how it tracks events and near misses uh, which should be reported to the insurers. Uh, the CFO was asked to provide an update for the next ARC on his propose, proposal uh, for professional indemnity insurance. Uh, so you can't recall why it was that you weren't present at this meeting for this discussion? Um, no. Again, looking at this now, does that seem like a relatively significant moment, the discussion of the insurance position relating to Project Sparrow? No, my, my view on the insurance issue is, as we'd already discussed earlier today, okay. I think this would probably be the follow-up from all of the um, actions initiated in July, which Alistair had been taking forward having looked at the way that the notification took place and the information that was in that notification, uh, do you think it would have been helpful to have scrutinized uh, the insurance notification more at board level? I think the point you're making is about information that was coming to the board, which could have helped overall in this situation. And obviously, as I said before, if we had seen some of those papers, uh, if the executive had provided some of that information after we asked them not to blindside us and to be open with us, then of course that would have helped. I, sorry, I wasn't seeing it as a sort of insurance issue per se. You're making the point, if I had seen the Bond Dickinson note that mentioned Gareth Jenkins in the summer of 2013, would that have made a difference? My answer is yes. There's reference in these board minutes to the link latest advice. I'd very briefly like to take you to that. That's at poll three zeros three oh seven two four. And the link latest advice can be found at page four. Do you recall that advice going to the board? Yes, I do. Um, and the partner came to the board. Was it unusual in your experience for legal advice of this nature to be shared at board level? 
as a, as a general rule in all the board conversations and situations I've seen and you know, even now thinking about me as an executive with a board of non-executive directors, you don't always share all of the underlying information, but what you do expect is if the underlying information is material that it's being accurately summarized and if there's something particular that would benefit the reader from seeing the whole paper that you share the whole paper. So um, I think we as a board wanted that link latest advice. It was something we commissioned ourselves. So I think I found it helpful to see both the paper and the partner as it were. If we scroll over the page, please, we can see the executive summary. The link latest advice, um, it says it summarizes our key conclusions on the legal analysis of the complaints made by sub postmasters about Horizon. And at 1.3, it says the key factual issue is whether and to what extent Horizon might be said to be reliable, what defects there may be in it, and how any such defects might manifest themselves and translate into errors in the state of the account uh, between an individual sub postmaster and the post office. Such relevant legal risks as exist arise only in the event that there are provable malfunctions in the Horizon system which are causative of losses on the part of the sub-postmaster. From your perspective, was it not important at this time to grapple uh, urgently with whether the system was in fact reliable, which is something that wasn't addressed by this advice? Yeah, and I think that's why um, at this board and then afterwards, the Deloitte work was commissioned. Because this, the premise of this advice as set out was, and I'm summarizing, these might not be the right words, but the system works. So I think what Linklaters was saying, which we agreed with, was you need to get some basis to check that point. And we're now in March 2014. Why, in your view, are things moving so slowly in that respect? I think if you look at the long arc of this issue, where, unfortunately, problems have been arising for over a decade, this, to us at the time, to us as a board, who'd had the Second Sight Interim Report in July 2013, actually felt that we'd taken a lot of actions, we were trying to uncover things and move at pace, of course, often with complex issues, each stone you lift, you find something more complicated. And I think we felt that uh, as well as all of the work described in paragraph 140 of my statement, we wanted then to have this Deloitte piece of work, which was uh, a way of looking at the IT problems. This, this link to piece of work was a question of legal issues and compensation and so on. Wasn't the functioning of the system quite an obvious and large stone to unturn? Well, the, the second site work had been looking at the system and related issues. The July 8th report, the interim report, as we've discussed, had a series of complicated and difficult messages on the one hand the words no systemic issues but on the other hand it was very clear through the spot reviews that a combination of factors could create problems so um, at the time I think we felt taking the actions including with the mediation scheme and the other steps was a way to try and be prudent about this set of issues um, but we also, as a board, hadn't commissioned anything other than the Second Sight Interim Report, so I think this was, and it felt at the time, another important step. Okay, I'm going to turn to one final issue very briefly, and that's risk reporting. Prior to becoming a non-executive director, was there a system for reporting <coughs> post office risks within checks uh, that you were aware of? So during my time in the shareholder executive, um, I joined in 2006. Um, I worked on a few different situations. And in simple terms, I think the, the role of that team looking after a series of different situations 
evolved and matured, including in relation to risk reporting. So we used to have um, quarterly meetings in relation to the individual companies or projects, if it wasn't a company, um, and the risk reporting was on a journey of improvement. I, I don't remember thinking, it's hard to think back now, to all of the, the different iterations. I think it was broadly in line with best practice at the time, for example, in the department or in the private sector. If you looked at it now with a 2024 hat on, I think you'd think it was quite unsophisticated, but I don't think we were particularly out of line. Did the system change while you were non-executive director in respect of your ability to report risks to checks? When I was a non-executive director, I would have been primarily interfacing with the post office's risk practices and what we did as that board through the Audit and Risk Committee to improve our risk management and to look at uh, different areas of what I would call the control environment. As we've discussed, I would be giving reflection, views, commentary to the shareholder team. They were then responsible for what was in the risk registers that they were managing. So I wouldn't have seen those risk registers that they had after the 14th of March 2012 when I left the building. Thank you, sir. Uh, those are all the questions I have. Uh, before CPs ask any questions, uh, I have been musing about this debate that the board had um, about options B or C in mm -hmm. terms of prosecution policy, all right? And clearly there was um, a difference of view about it. But in the discussions which did take place, was there any acknowledgement or discussion that in Scotland and Northern Ireland, nobody but for the CPS mm. could prosecute? And was that not considered as a material factor in terms of England and Wales? I, I do have a background recollection of that, but now that you say it, I don't know why it wasn't in that paper. Um, so I can't recall. I can't recall why. Um, I just, I just remember feeling myself uncomfortable. Yeah, well, I, I, and I understand there was a difference of view, but, um, and I'm not necessarily mm -hmm. expecting that you would have known. No, no, I get personally, your point. I get your point. But someone in that board would have known <laughs> yeah. that in Scotland and Northern yeah, Ireland it had to be the Procurator Fiscal or the CPS version in Belfast, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you, sir. It's Ms. Page and then Mr. Steen. Thank you. In your statement, Ms. Story, you describe a critical moment in the summer of 2013 when the board was deprived of the information it needed. Um, and you say at precisely the time when the executive should have been at their most open with us. And the information you were talking about was the information that was within the clerk advice um, that Gareth Jenkins had been acting as an expert witness and that he was, quote, tainted. Yes. Um, on, on that issue, in your statement, you said that you didn't feel able to say whether the board was deliberately being kept in the dark by the executive. That's how you put it in your statement, not exactly those words, but broadly. What I'd like to do is show an email that the inquiry's seen a few times um, to see if we can get any closer to an answer on that. Um, so if we could look, please, at poll 2038... 2001, and this is the uh, email which has come up a few times. It's between Miss Venels and Miss Perkins about an unsafe witness. It dates from November 2013, and hopefully you've seen it before. Yeah, I've seen that one. But I'd like to just zoom in on the important words. So if we could scroll down a little to uh, my concern, the um, email begins between Miss Venels and Miss Perkins or rather the paragraph within it. Yes, so there we are at the bottom. My concern, re Sparrow, currently is our obligations of disclosure re an unsafe witness. The representative from Fujitsu made statements about no bugs, which later could be seen to have been undermined by the SS report. We do not think it material, but it could be high profile. 
So um, that actually very succinctly encapsulates what uh, Mr. Clark enunciated much more fully in his advice. Um, would you have wanted to know about this unsafe witness and the obligation to disclose the fact that he had made statements about there being no bugs? Would you have wanted to know about that? Of course, of course. Do you think that the board's discussions in the months leading up to November would have made it clear to Ms. Venels and Ms. Perkins that the board would want to know about that unsafe witness? I do. I. I've hopefully tried to give a general sense that we were quite a difficult set of non-executive directors um, and we wanted to know things. And when something goes wrong, the, yeah, I, I think those are the times when you need to be absolutely as open as you can. And in my preparation for this inquiry, I've now seen a lot of documents that I didn't see at the time, and I would say, even since I wrote my witness statement, my position on this issue has hardened. Mm. And when you say hardened, can you tell us exactly what you mean by that? I mean that I've seen a number of things that I think were relative contextual information that add to the weight of the issues being significant, which were then not reported to us as significant. So an example that I was reading about last week was that Shoesmiths uh, did put written evidence to the 15th of May Department of Business Select Committee. They didn't appear at the hearing. Paula Venels and George Thompson appeared. That's an example of something. We then met as a board the week later. That Select Committee is referenced. The Select Committee itself didn't pick up that issue in its own response, but it, it makes me think there was quite a lot of information um, which, which was important and relevant. Obviously, I'm applying hindsight. You know, I, I can't put myself in the shoes of those people, which is why I phrased it in the way I did in my mm. statement. Mr. McCausland told us yesterday um, and obviously on the same uh, page as you in this respect, that uh, the board did not know about the contents of the Clark advice. But he also said that he was told that there was a Fujitsu expert witness who could not be used anymore, um, but that that person could not be used anymore because they'd moved on or they had retired or some such. Um, he wasn't given a name. Um, he, the important point, perhaps, is that he was given the impression that there was an innocuous reason uh, for that witness not to be used anymore, and therefore the taint was hidden. Um, and he thought that that was perhaps at some point in the latter half of 2013. Do you remember being told anything like that? I do not. I heard what he said yesterday when I watched it last night. I, I don't recall that. No. Bear in mind that... Neil, um, as a senior independent non-executive director, would have been in and around the business perhaps a bit more, so perhaps he had some other conversations. And, and possibly also went to those board meetings which you didn't in the latter half of 2013. That's true, that's true. Um, that was, of course, at the same time or around the same time as, um, uh, as the insurers were being informed and given the name Gareth Jenkins. Um, so again, uh, coming back to this point, um, does this show that the board was actually being kept in the dark, as it were? Uh, you were not being told about Gareth Jenkins, but insurers were. There was obviously a significant asymmetry of information between um, what we were getting, which you've seen, it, both the papers and the minutes, and uh, what some other parties were aware of and were getting. All right, can we look please at another email, poll 0029-6944. This is just going back a little bit to uh, the 1st of July telephone board meeting and the reaction afterwards. Uh, this is Paula Venels to Alice Perkins at 9.07 p.m., so on the day but afterwards. 
Hi, Alice. I'm looking forward to catching up properly tomorrow. I thought the board were generous in their patience tonight over the SS discussion. It's helpful to know that they are supportive of the need to be robust. That said, I thought Alistair's intervention was good. It is why we haven't been completely heavy-handed yet. We can discuss nuances and next steps tomorrow. Now, um, what do you recall of the meeting that would have led her to say that the board were supportive of the need to be robust? I, I can't be sure because um, this is an email exchange between her and Alice. I am assuming, but I'm just assuming, it could have related to the point she was making on that call about the need for factual accuracy. And obviously we were being told that day that this report was going to go into the public domain, the executive were not happy with it, they were concerned about accuracy, and they then went on to tell us about that. So it may be that she's referencing the need to be robust for second sight about the need to be uh, accurate and factual. But and, I, I can't be sure. And do you think that the board was supportive of her view on that? I think, uh, yeah, the, I think the board... The board heard what Paula said on that call. We absolutely wouldn't have wanted a document to go into the public domain that wasn't factually accurate. And um, we did trust the executive. We had no reason not to. So yeah, there, there's no reason, I think, that this, this would be incorrect, what she's reporting as us, her view of what we thought ha having been. Sorry, that's not a great sentence. No, understood. Um, then sort of counterposed with that, she says, you know, that said, so in other words, on the other hand, I thought Alistair's intervention was good. It is why we haven't been completely heavy-handed yet. Can you decode that for us at all? Does that make any sense? I, I don't recall uh, what specifically Alistair said. Um, I wonder if it's to do with the interface with Second Sight and, you know, it's plausible, isn't it, because it was a debate later that there was a concern about the scope and time their work was taking, the cost, the sort of desire to have some fixed parameters around it. So it may be that it was a reference to that and so Paula sort of implying that she might in due course need, in her words, to be heavy handed with Second Sight, but I can't be sure. All right, well, it carries on. I caught up with Susan this evening after we finished. She had finished her meeting with Second Sight, and presumably this is and was of the view, that they do now understand the risk of being caught up in something bigger and more sensitive. She is hoping their report should be more balanced, should say they've found no evidence of systemic horizon computer issues, but will confirm shortcomings in support processes and systems, and that Post Office has already identified and corrected a number of these. I hope when they speak to James tomorrow that they will confirm all this. They will also want to say their work is not finished and therefore still not conclusive. And then she says this, not a final position by any means, nor one that controls what they might say rather than write, but sounding slightly better. Uh, did you know that the business were making efforts to control what was written by Second Sight? Um, n not in that way as described there, uh, and it, it was an independent report, so no. And then, um, particularly, she seems to be um, pleased, shall we say, or perhaps that's inferring too much, but in any event, she reports that Susan Crichton had told them about the risks of being caught up in something bigger and more sensitive. Um, I mean, I, again, I hope I'm not reading too much, but it, it's sort of an implied threat, isn't it? Did you know that the business was involved in, in sort of warning second sight of risks? No, I, I don't really know what that sentence means. I have to say that the end of it, there's something bigger and more sensitive... Uh, I've obviously read this before today because mm. I've seen it in the disclosure documents, but I don't, I don't know what that's referring to. No. Um, so 
again, perhaps some, some issues going on behind the scenes that the board were being kept in the dark <coughs> about. And yes. you're nodding. Yes. yes. Just for the transcript. Sorry, sorry. Yes, I am nodding. I agree. Um, can I also just have a look at this email? UKGI 3045624. This is... Uh, between Richard Callard, um, if we scroll down a bit, the email that um, we can perhaps look at is between Richard Callard and Tom Cooper in 2020, so considerably after the events we're looking at. Um, and, and obviously, um, he's reporting back on a conversation he had with you, and, and people no doubt have their own slightly different recollections of conversations, so um, you may wish to uh, comment on, on various parts of this email, but um, there are a couple of these bullet points that I wanted to focus upon. The second one, uh, it's, about, it's about the whole Sparrow thing, as Richard Callard puts it. The second bullet says, she does remember it becoming an increasing thing after joining. Remembers Paula indicating that there was nothing much to see here, it's a small number of sub-postmasters a long time ago, business was getting assurance, etc. But then in the next bullet, Neds and Alice increasingly worried at the seemingly slow pace of the execs' response, and our Arbuthnot had started to fan the flames. The board felt this was mischief-making that was fanning the flames and was becoming a populist cause. Is this... Come, who, who, if that's the correct reporting of your conversation... Where is this idea of mischief-making, fanning the flames, a populist cause coming from? Yeah, I only saw this email very recently. Um, I didn't know... I did meet Richard Callard from time to time. Uh, I wanted to make sure he was getting the support he needed. I do recall having various conversations with him, including presumably one in March or April 2020, I didn't know he was taking notes, I didn't know he was recording it, and I can't say uh, exactly where all of these things have come from. Obviously, what I've tried to do in a very open way is set out my recollections and my reflections in my witness statement, and that is after I've read all the documents. So mm. at this point in 2020, which would have been six years after I left, um, I'm not sure how much reliance can be put on this. And, and in other words, are you saying that you don't believe that you said that there was mischief making or a populist cause? I don't. I don't remember those words. Um, so it, it, honestly, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to say. Do you think that there was any propensity on the board to uh, be predisposed in that direction, or was that something the board was being steered towards by the executive? I think from the beginning of our conversations as a board about what became the Second Sight Interim Report, Alice was keenly aware in the way she portrayed it to us that there was a whole series of issues that had been going on for a long time that understandably James Arbuthnot was very worried about, as was Sir Alan Bates. She wanted to get the work done to look at it, um, and that's what's happened. That's... Mm. That's my recollection. Well, can we look at the second site relationship over a slightly longer time frame and in broad terms? Uh, in 2012, um, sorry, the email can come down unless there's anything else you want to tell us about it while it's up there. No. No. Um, in 2012, the chair and the CEO announced the second site review to the board as just a little bit of AOB. Right? That's the, the first the board gets to hear about it. Yeah, it was in the AOB part of the discussion. I don't think it was just a little bit... I wouldn't use exactly those words, but I understand, of course, the point you're making. It, it didn't come as a paper, nor as a main agenda item. No history, nothing about past prosecutions, um, the, the reasons that lay behind why Second Sight had been called in, in effect. The fact that over many, many years, people had been being prosecuted on the back of the horizon evidence 
and that therefore there were multiple complaints to MPs about those prosecutions. That wasn't part of the history that you heard about. It, at that May 2012 board meeting, no, it was nothing like the horrific extent of what I now understand. It was, Or a, even a, what was understood at the time, in the sense that a number of MPs had made complaints, uh, a number of newspaper articles had been written, there was a growing groundswell of people complaining about Horizon that required this to happen. That wasn't made clear, was it? No, not in the May 2012, um, any other business discussion, no. No. And so then, um, following that, each month, uh, the chair draws up the agenda and she puts the significant litigation report below the line just for noting, not for discussion, month after month. Uh, and at the point where there's um, second sight part, uh, included as part of that, there's kind of a couple of lines on second sight in those significant litigation reports, but not for discussion. The... Um Yes, I mean, you're right that the May 2012 board meeting was when Alice and Paula reported their meetings to us with James Arbuthnot, um, and then the Second Sight work started, um, as well as the significant litigation reports, which were in the papers every month <coughs> and expanded over time in terms of their content. There were, from time to time, updates, for example, if one of... Um, Alice Perkins or Paula Venels had met Lord Arbuthnot or Sir Alan Bates, they might update on that. And I think from time to time, the board said, what's happened on that work? So there was a bit of to and fro, but nothing like the volume and focus, um, as you'll see from the 1st of July, 2013, until I left the <coughs> board in 2014. And indeed, um in May 2013, the board did actually ask for a formal update, right. which you did not receive. We did not. Um, and the, the next sort of thing we got, which is why, as I've discussed, there was irritation, was this 1st of July. Uh, exactly. Call. When you were blindsided. Yeah. So even, then, even though you had asked in May for a proper update, you then get nothing until you're blindsided and told that there's an urgent need to deal with a report that's about to be presented to Parliament. Um, so in effect, over that whole first year, the board is not substantively updated on the work of Second Sight. And, uh, and indeed, the agenda is managed in a way that everything about it is put sort of below the line. Everything in the papers, at least, is put below the line just for noting, nothing for a proper discussion. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I know now from the papers I've read that there was quite a lot of to and fro between the company and Second Sight in the months that led up to the publication of the interim report, but we were really getting very little colour on that. And as you say, the written papers that we were receiving were more... <coughs> as a, so, a sort of risk update. They're positioned as there are these situations, but, but not presented to us in the way that we then <coughs> to understand them. And then we get to the July 2013 board. Um, and in the background, so just a few more questions, and I don't have many more. Um, it's just worth bearing in mind this, that they are the July board is a missed opportunity arising from the fact that Miss Crichton was not presenting her own paper because she had received the Clark advice. She knew much more than the board did about past and present prosecutions. The fact that she did not present her paper and become subject to questions from the board means that her knowledge of the Clark advice stood no chance of being revealed to the board. Um, and Miss Perkins gave an account to this inquiry about why Miss Crichton didn't come into board to present her paper. Um, at the end of that, Mr. Beer asked her, why is none of that reflected in the board minutes? And after a few uh, false starts, her answer was, I don't know the answer to that question. Was it your experience of the minute taking at poll that important discussions were not reflected in the minutes? My recollection was that 
Alwyn Lyons was a, digit, a, a diligent company secretary, the nature of minutes from any board meeting and frankly any other meeting often doesn't give you give the reader all of the to and fro and who said what and might not include somebody having been expected to present a paper and then not. So I don't think that in itself was unusual. I obviously appreciate how frustrating it is now and you know for me as a reader trying to jog my memory, of course I think we all wish there was a lot more colour on this issue. But no, of course minutes don't reflect everything. But would you have experienced a case where there's a discussion about something significant and it just doesn't appear in the minutes? Um, I, I mean, I can't think of examples of that now, looking back. If we were contemporaneous, I'm sure it would be much easier for me to give you an illustration of that. Nothing, Let, nothing sticks in your mind about no, it? No. All right, fine. Is that it, Ms. Page? Just very briefly, if I may, sir, um, in your time on the board, was Miss Perkins somebody that you would have found or did you find her to be capable of leading and controlling board discussions? Alice uh, had a lot of experience of board interfaces because part of her day job was coaching people and coaching boards. And my experience was she took this role really very seriously. She was very committed to it and I think wanted to make sure there was a good discussion of all of the issues across these difficult areas. I think uh, if people felt strongly about things, they would say them anyway. She probably was quite good at sometimes drawing a conversation to a close or asking us to pick it up offline. So I, I think she was, she was rigorous. Would you have said that the July board kicked off in any way? Kicked off is not a, a sort of expression I would particularly use, but I mean, as we've discussed today, and as I think the minutes reflect, it, it was an uncomfortable board, and we had a difficult discussion before the board, just the Neds uh, who were there, Neil was not there that day, but for the Neds and the chair. Um, the board meeting was difficult. Kicked off slightly implies uncontrollable, I, I wouldn't say It that. wasn't uncontrollable, it was controlled, in effect. Controlled in the sense of orderly. I mm. don't mean controlled to my memory in the sense of... Steered. No, Ste not steered, yeah, yeah. but, but yeah. in the sense that at no stage did Miss Perkins actually lose control of what was being said in the meeting. I don't recall that. She's, she's quite a calm person. Um, I don't recall that. No. Thank you. Those, thank you, sir. Mr. Steen. So attempted as I am to say, I've got a clear hour. Um, so I think I'll be about 15. Tempting as I would have to say, <laughs> no, you haven't. <laughs> I think about 15 minutes, um, if that uh, suits both the uh, panel and... Yes, it does. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Well, I, I'll, I'll be rigorous, Ms. Uh, Page, and hold Mr. Steen to 15 minutes. So I'll look at Mr. Page's watch now. <laughs> if we go. Time, the time is on, Ms. Story. Ms. Story, I, I represent a large group of sub-postmasters, uh, um, also people working in branches at the small branches that you're familiar with right up and down the country. Um, can I just take you to two passages in your statement to start off with, please? Um, there are parts of the statement whereby you refer to being reassured about the system, the horizon system. So paragraph 17, and I'm going to go to page 8 of your statement. So I'd like it on the screen, please. So paragraph 17, but it's actually at page 8 of the statement. And it's the last, I suppose, um, few lines of that paragraph. So if we go to page 8 and we look at that top paragraph. I'm very grateful. That's, uh, that's ideal. Thank you very much. So if you look, look above um, paragraph 18, the bit I'm after is, is just above there. Um, and what, you, what you're talking about there is that uh, you, um, you're talking about Paul had full confidence in the Horizon system. The system had been rigorously tested. Uh, full confidence in the accuracy and robustness of the system was shared by the NFSP. As I explained below, this was the consistent position adopted by the company in relation to Horizon throughout my tenure on the board. Um, paragraph 20, which appears, and the bit that I need is at, uh, sorry, paragraph 21 at page 10 now, please. So paragraph 21, page 10. 
and the la again, last few lines of paragraph 21. So very similar there. I referred above to the poll statement circulated November 2011, uh, then relativity reference, expressing full confidence in the accuracy and robustness of the system. And I do not recall hearing or reading anything that was consistent with those assertions. So we can see from your statement that at two occasions you're referring to what you understood the position to be, having been informed by the post office, the system works fine. Yes. Now, um, we then get, in terms of the, the order of things, we get a reference within your statement to another document I'd like to refer to, please which is an SLR, I'll ask this to go on the screen, please, UKGI 0018251. So UKGI 0018251. Now, this may appear as a slightly faded document on the copy that we're about to look at, but we'll make our way through it. Yeah. Um, on, I've got, my screen is quite small. If that could be expanded slightly, I'd be very grateful if it's possible. Yes. If we just work our way down. Right, now, if we hold it there for a second. So the SLR is referring, as you can see there, under the, to the right-hand side of privileged and confidential uh, claims over 500,000 uh, or those of a sensitive nature. And then if we look at file name Horizon Claims and then reference to case holder, we then see a name that's very familiar to this inquiry, Rod Ismay. Yeah of poll. Now, significance of Mr. Ismay for the inquiry, you, you, you've been following the inquiry clearly. I have. He, he wrote what we called yeah. in the inquiry what's called the Whitewash Report, 2010, yeah. saying essentially no bugs here. Okay? The, yeah, the Ismay Report that I think David Smith had asked him to produce. Yes, yeah. and if we then have a look then at what is going on, we see a reference, you know, I know it's very faded and slightly hard to it's see. It's okay, I can read it. Okay, great. Um, Look at the middle column under description. We've got a reference to Shoesmiths under the fourth paragraph. Shoesmiths assert that they have con consulted on a further 85 cases, which are all likely to raise similar legal issues. Thank you. And if you go up above that one, uh, the third one, if you can do the, the, the yellow line trick above uh, to the each alleges wrongful termination, thank you. Each alleged is wrongful termination of contract based upon A, alleged defects in polls, internal processes, and B, alleged defects with Horizon, okay? Then we'll move across, again, names that are familiar to this inquiry. Um, uh, Mr. Darlington um, is talking about his position, the claim rejected on the basis that the SPMR admitted to what was committed to and was convicted of false accounting and then response in relation to Shoesmiths, and then an update as to the position. Okay. So we see that there are um, Shoesmiths <coughs> setting out the fact that they've got 85 clients, plus the then five that are here, all setting out. This is the summary of the situation, which is they're all saying there are problems within the system. Now, you refer to this document, at paragraph 66, of your statement. That's at page 32, paragraph 66. And I want you to help us with uh, what you mean by some of the terms that you're using. So if we can now go to paragraph 66, page 32 of your statement. So this is sent to you, this document, you refer to this as being um, uh, a part of the board pack for your first board meeting. Um, now, it, it, it might be said that as it's your for, first board meeting, you may have um, read the lot rather than having an ability to, to, to sift, but let's see how we go. The SLR, the one we just referred to, appears to have been included within the board papers, but below the line for noting only, i.e. not for discussion by or at the board. As I've explained, the board papers would include papers that were intended to form the basis of discussion by the board and papers which we requested note for information but are not usually discussed. Um, help us translate the corporate speak here, if you don't mind. What, when you're saying um, peers have been included within the board papers but below the line and for noting only, i.e. not for discussion by or at the board, 
What does that mean? It, below the line, nobody reads it at all, or um, people are expected to read it and raise something if they think about it? Help us. Yeah, so what I mean by that is that the board agenda would set out each of the items that were going to be discussed at the board. Each one would have a timetable committed to it. That would basically take up the bulk of the day if a board meeting went from nine till four. And then just at the end of the day, in my experience of the post office with these matters, there were items that were not being raised to the board for discussion, but only to note, which means you needed to read it and agree that you had noted it. And that was the nature of these significant litigation reports. Shoesmith is saying they've got 90 people all saying the problems with the Horizon system. Was that something that came to your attention in terms of you thinking about it and saying, hang on, that's a heck of a lot of people? Did it come to your attention in that way? I don't recall it coming to my attention in that way at that board meeting. And you know that's one of the things, obviously, that I've said I regret. I, my reflection is, and I understand why, you know, from your position, this will sound odd, but in the shoes that I was in and as a non-executive board member, we were getting quite strong assurances that this system is robust, nothing to see here. So I think I was trusting what the execs were saying, but I take All right, well, let's, let's keep on going. Um, you're talking about shoes. I'm going to talk about shoesmiths a bit more. Yes. P-O-L-0014-1382. POL 0041 Now, you go away on maternity leave. I have this from your statement. Um, it's 2000, is it March 2012 to March 2013? Um, no, I had the baby in March 2013, and I started on the board in April. Sorry, in March 2012, and I started on the board in April 2012. Right. Okay, maybe I've noted it from your statement. So I'm not sure whether you are around at the time of this particular document. We go to the end of the document, I think it's July of 2012. But let's have a look through. I want to go to particular paragraphs. Paragraph two to start off with. It's a very good summary of the situation. Paragraph two. I'm going to summarise this because I've got a clock ticking. Um, access legal from Shoesmith's national firm. Contacted by 100 SPM. So you see the same, uh, same numbers. Numbers, in fact, are going up by this point. They suffered losses. Those losses can't be explained. They've been subject to disciplinary measures. All are adamant that they or their staff have not stolen any money. Horizon Systems at fault, they say, that the post office requires them to use it. They claim, for the last uh, three lines, they claim there has been no real investigation by poll as to the cause of the losses that have appeared. So SPMs are expected to pay it back regardless of how, regardless of how it was caused. Can we go to paragraphs 11 and 12 together? They appear, I think, uh, close to each other. Uh, paragraph uh, 11, uh, poll will ask an SPM to repay all losses. Um, I, I, I've used this document before in another context, so I'm just going to go to a slightly different part to assist uh, the inquiry. Last line of paragraph 11 says, it is far from clear whether there is a loss in a sub post office that poll have actually lost any money. So it's far from clear as to whether any money has ever gone missing. And then 12, again, I will summarize. If the loss not repaid, poll will prosecute the SPM for false accounting. And then people are being advised um, to plead guilty to false accounting um, uh, in the circumstances. Many will be charged with theft or fraud, but these charges are typically dropped. Um, and SPNs have been in prison for false accounting. These are, these are serious and quite complex issues that are being raised. And lastly, 14 and 16. Right, 14, the contract's old. This is what it's saying. It goes back to 1994. It was designed for a paper system, no good for a digital system. That's what 14 is saying. And then um, 16, just finishing, Ports with Horizon, Loads of ways, this is saying, there could be problems in the horizon. System error, human errors, faults with cross-system communications, electrical faults. Doesn't matter, it goes on to say, how they're occurring. It's happening. So you've got complicated, detailed submissions being made by Shoesmiths in relation to the network transformation consultation. That's what's going on here. 
yeah. saying, look, there are real problems, lots of people we've got all having difficulties in the same way. Now, first question in relates to this. If, if I'm right in thinking about the timing of when you were away, was, was this brought to your attention, if I've got the timing right, when you came back from maternity leave, or, were, or are you in any way familiar with this document at the time? At the time? So, just firstly, uh, I never was away on my maternity leave, so ah. I had the baby and then started on the board. Okay. So I was on the board when I was on my maternity leave, so that are you familiar with this doesn't document? matter. This document, um, I am now, it's a written submission, as you're saying, to the Department of Business Select Committee. Correct. On The hearing was in May 2012 and it was on network transformation. Shoe Smith's made this submission, it was a written submission, it's in the papers. Um, Paula Venels appeared at that hearing, and it's the one that I was referring to earlier. She appeared on the 15th of May, um, and... At the time of these sorts of matters, around this period of time, what, forgive me for summarising yeah, your sorry. position, were you familiar with what was going on in these submissions? Was I had it, not or? seen this submission, no, no. no. Okay. But, but the point I was making before was, when we were given the update, for example, at the board on the Bayes Select Committee that the Chief Executive had just appeared at, this particular submission wasn't referenced and it actually would have been extremely important to see at the time. But, because one of the simple ways through this would in fact have been somebody on the board or Miss Vannells, somebody to start speaking to the sub-postmasters because rapidly what would have happened would that that would have resulted in being told, look, every time we phone up the damn helpline, they just tell us to pay because of the contracts. I appreciate that. I... And, and that's masking people making complaints about the system. They keep on telling us to pay and I'm trying to say, look, there's a problem. I appreciate that. If and that had been looked into. Yeah, and also the parliamentary committee didn't pick up this issue. I think in the hearing, Caroline Dynage MP asked one question, which George Thompson took, but it, it wasn't even referred to in the committees. No, we have a slight problem with parliamentary privilege, right? So therefore... A a anyway, uh, I'm just on this, can, can I just be clear? There was no attempt by the post office executives to bring this sort of detail however it came into being, but did no attempt to bring this sort of detail to the board. No. Right. Okay. Right. We then get through, and you've been asked a lot of questions about this by Mr. Blake, and some of them have been then looked at again um, uh, afterwards. So just, just, just to finish, you get to the stage whereby you uh, <coughs> read and you're aware of the contents of the second site interim report. Okay. Yes. Now, we don't need to go to it, one of the, but one of the most significant things about that report is saying that, that there's bugs in the system, a couple of bugs. One, which is network trend, uh, mismatch bug, um, could really cause problems to people, okay? So let's go back to where I started with my questions. You're being told, system robust, no bugs, no problems with it, and then later on, 2.13, you're told that there are bugs, right? Did Ms. Venels, at this juncture, when you get the second site report and the discussions at the board about it, did she say to, to the board, or, or you individually, one of the things that's really peculiar about this is that I've been reassured, reassured, and reassured there are no bugs in the system, and then, quite surprisingly, or perhaps using other words, I've now learnt through second sight and, uh, and, and details before that there are bugs in the system. And we really ought to look into this as to why we weren't told about this before. Did she ever say something like that? Because I might feel a bit misled in that situation if I were in her shoes. No, she... Right. Not, not in... And what about you and the other people on the board? You're in a similar position. You're, you, you agree with Ms Page and Ms. Ble Mr Blake that you feel as though the board was left in a bit of a vacuum on information. But the one thing that you've been told at the beginning is no bugs in the system. And, and yet in 2013, you're told about bugs that will affect branch accounts. Did, did you ever get, or did, was there any discussion at the board? Why on earth have we been told that there were no bugs in the system? Who's been making this up? What's going on? Did you ever get to that? Because as an example, Mr. Ismay, who I referred to right at the beginning, he learned in 2011 about the mismatch bug. So it's been going for years. The post office has known about these things. Yeah, I, I can't speak to the sort of pre-2012 period, although obviously I know that when I started on that board, we had none of the long history from the Royal Mail Group. We were not getting any concerns flagged by internal or any material concerns from internal or external audit. To your point, 
when it came to the second site interim report, it did flag those issues from the spot reviews very clearly. It also said there were no systemic issues. It also flagged some serious concerns that we needed to look at. And at the time in 2013, those were the steps that we thought we were taking. You th forgive me for interrupting. I, again, I'm slightly thinking about the t seconds ticking, but did, they've ticked, but they've, carry they, on. Yeah. They've well ticked. But, <coughs> yeah. but did you think to yourself, or the board think to itself, well, hang on, we ought to look into why we've been reassured about something that ain't true? Well, I think at the time, we did have various elements of discontent that we expressed to the executive, and then we set about a series of actions that we felt we could control to try and get to the bottom of these but things. That one? Well, I think the answer to the question is that you didn't inquire, as Mr. Steen suggested you should. What you did, by the look of it, is to accept the explanation you were given, namely there had been two bugs, but they've been cured. That's what, looks, that's what happened, isn't it? Yeah, I think we, yeah. we took what the, the executive were clear about their view at that point in July 2013, we had no particular basis to think anything different, and then we started to take a series of steps, and then, as I said earlier to Mr. Blake, part of the point, from my perspective, of the Deloitte report was to try and get under the skin of the item. Outward facing from this, going into then the question of who, it doesn't matter who's prosecuting, whether it's the CPS in Northern Ireland, whether it's Procurator Fiscal in Scotland, whether it's a Post Office in England. We know that prosecutions continue. I've referred to Ms. Falcon, who was prosecuted at the beginning of 2015, using data from the Horizon system. Prosecutions continued using Horizon data. Didn't the board say to itself, well, hang on, well, haven't we got to make sure that what on earth is going on with this? If there's bugs in the system, like being set out in that report, we, the board, have to be responsible for making sure that we stop it right now. Well, I can only speak to the board until I step down in 2014. Well, I think that's really a speech, not a question. Uh, it so is. I think we'll call it there. Call it a day there, Mr. Steen. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So those are all the questions for Ms. Story. Right. Now, we're not quite at the end of this afternoon session because Mr. Beer wants to make one or two announcements. <coughs> but that does conclude your evidence, Ms. Story. So you're very welcome to sit there and listen to Mr. Beer for a couple of minutes, or you can disappear as you prefer. But for certain, I'd like to thank you for making your witness statement, which is a very detailed one, and for asking questions for the greater part of today. So thank you very much. And if you'd like to leave, now is your chance. Otherwise, Mr. Beer is going to start. No, I won't take offence at all. No, no. <laughs> so as we've come to the end of um, phases five and six... Well, is that true? At least the principal <laughs> part of the evidence taking for phases five and six... I thought it might assist to firstly draw the threads together in terms of the nature and extent of the evidence that you've heard. Uh, secondly, to read some statements into the record. In fact, um, those statements reased, uh, received in the course of this phase, these phases, but which relate to other phases of the inquiry, phases two, three, and four. And then thirdly, to say something um, quite short about the independent surveys that are being conducted for the purposes of phase seven of the inquiry. So firstly, the evidence heard in phases five and six. Over the course of um, 16 weeks, sir, you've heard um, evidence from people at the highest level within the post office and government, uh, paying careful attention to the three questions which run through every stage of this inquiry, uh, who knew what and when about the issues with Horizon. Uh, since April of this year, you have heard oral evidence from 66 witnesses. You will hear evidence from a small number of witnesses on phase five and six issues uh, in the course of phase seven. Their evidence could not be taken during the course of the last 16 weeks for one reason or another. Um, as in uh, other phases of the inquiry, the oral evidence that you have heard is not the entirety of the evidence that you will be considering. Aside from the huge volume of documentary evidence, there are the statements of witnesses who will be read into the record. I'm not going to do that now for phases five and six, i.e. Phase, and five, phase five and six witnesses. 
and instead I'll do that in the course of phase seven, when all or nearly all of the phase five and six written evidence is available to the inquiry. Owing to the scale of phases five and six, your inquiry team will continue to seek evidence and issue Rule 9 requests throughout August, and further evidence will be disclosed to core participants and then to the public in due course. At reading in of statements from phases two, three, and four. Uh, today, the inquiry will be publishing statements from witnesses about phase two, three, and four issues. Those statements will be admitted into evidence and treated as having been read into the record the witness statements will be uploaded shortly to the inquiry's website. The witnesses um, who fall into those categories are described in a PowerPoint presentation that I'd ask to be displayed, uh, INQ 402022. And if we look at page two, please. Uh, the um, names of the witnesses that are going to be um, uh, read into the record by uh, the act of displaying this document are listed on the left-hand side for phase two. There are um, uh, seven witnesses and um, eight statements because Mr. Folks has got two statements relating to phase two issues and the URNs are displayed in the right-hand column. Uh, over the page, please, to phase three. On this page and the next, there are um, 11 uh, witnesses, uh, Mr. Falks being the first of them, his fourth witness statement, who give evidence in relation to phase three issues. Names listed on the left, URNs, which I'm not going to read out, on the right. And over the page, please. That's the balance of the phase three witnesses. And then last page, please. Um, there are four witnesses who give evidence about phase four issues, uh, names on the left, URNs on the right. Uh, that can come down. The work of your inquiry so far has covered a period of over 20 years. It's heard evidence through um, uh, oral witnesses from 267 individuals. Uh, we have published the written evidence from a further 229 including those listed on that PowerPoint presentation. At your inquiry has disclosed to core participants almost 250,000 documents, totaling just under 2 million pages of evidence. I'm told for those wishing to visualize that number, if stacked up, it would be the length of two football pitches. Can we um, turn lastly then to phase seven of the inquiry? As we move on to the final phase of oral evidence, the inquiry will turn its focus to the current practice and the current procedures within the post office and within government in relation to the post office. Phase seven will include evidence from current and former senior officials and executives within the post office and government. But we will also return to looking at the effectiveness of the compensation schemes and the redress schemes building on your interim report published last year. But work on this phase has been going on in the background for many months now. Those following the inquiry will be aware that you have commissioned independent research and data analytics from a firm called YouGov, in particular to conduct two surveys to gather views from all current sub-postmasters and all applicants to the Horizon Shortfall Scheme. Uh, those two surveys are ongoing, they're live at the moment. And by way of update to you and uh, for others, I understand that so far over 2,000 recipients have either started to complete or have completed and returned the survey. We're surveying 16,000 people, so that is a response rate of around 12.5%, which I'm told is a promising start at this point of a research project. So, sir, that's all from me um, today. I would like to end by encouraging those, everyone who has received a link to these surveys, to complete them. It's vital from the inquiry's perspective that we enter phase seven 
with as full a body of evidence about the current position as is possible. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Beer. <clears throat> well, those who um, have had the grave misfortune of following what I do will know that I'm not very keen on repetition, but on this occasion, I do wish to repeat the appeal which Mr. Beer has made for continued participation in the two surveys. I'm obviously heartened by what he's had to say about the number of participants to date. But it is crucial that I get as full a response as possible to these surveys because we have looked long at the past, but now I'm coming up to date, so to speak, and I want to know about the present, both in terms of sub-postmasters' reactions to the present regime, survey number one, and postmasters' reactions to the compensation scheme, HSS, in particular. I think I am now brave enough to say that I have stretched my terms of reference on compensation to and perhaps beyond breaking point. It's something I am very keen to say as much about as I reasonably can. So I need as much help as possible from those who are claiming compensation in order to make proper conclusions about what has happened and whether it lives up to the mantra of being full and fair. <coughs> I want to stress that the surveys are not connected to the post office. I said that, I think, some weeks ago when they were first introduced. But I want to stress that because I can't help but think that they will be lurking in some people's minds. Do we really want to get involved with this? Is the post office somehow behind it? The post office is not. This is for the benefit of the inquiry. And so if you find it difficult to speak about challenges which you still face, you people out there whom I am addressing, please be assured that these surveys are for the benefit of the inquiry and therefore ultimately for the benefit of me writing a sensible report about the information they will contain. Let me just say something about phase seven. I think, in fact, I'm 95% sure that this will begin in the week commencing the 23rd of September. There are significant issues to examine. I don't want to rush it. So what I expect is that hearings will run into November, quite how far into November, we'll have to see, because I have decided that you all deserve a break in the middle of this phase seven, so that there won't be sittings in the last week of October and the first week in November, i.e. the potential half-term weeks when people may want to take a break. A witness timetable for these sessions will be published as soon as we can reasonably do that. All that will be left after the phase seven evidence is um, closing submissions. And I want to tell you what I have in mind, and I'm telling you this now so that if anybody violently objects, they'll have a chance to register their objection. What I want is that the substance of closing submissions are in writing. I do not want anyone to get the impression that I'm going to sit here or on screen for a number of weeks listening to oral submissions, because I'm not. What I will allow are reasonably short oral submissions so that the advocates can demonstrate their oratorical, oratorical skills and treat me as if I'm a jury in the Old Bailey, even though I'm not but it will allow there to be some human impact 
to those oral submissions. So I would expect that oral submissions will last for, say, up to two days, but the bulk of it has to be done in writing, not least because that's the best way that I can ultimately digest what is being said. And with a fair wind, all that will be completed for all you to go off and enjoy your Christmas holidays and for me to think, oh my goodness, what comes next? Can I thank you all for participating as you have done in this phase of the inquiry? Mr. Beer, with his <coughs> usual um, understatement, has reduced 66 witnesses and goodness knows how many documents he mentioned as if it was an everyday occurrence. With the cooperation of all of you, we have got through an enormous amount of work in a very short period of time. And for that, I am eternally grateful for every single person who participates in this inquiry. You've heard me praise my team up to the, the sky is the limit, but all you, and I'm looking past Mr. Beer because Mr. Chapman hides in the corner there and I can never see him, but every CP in this room deserves credit together with their legal teams for facilitating my work. So thank you all very much. Um, I'm going to retreat back to Wales shortly um, and escape the heat of London, but I'll see you again in the autumn. Thanks, so. Right, there we are. Thank <clears throat> you.